It's the desires of our heart. And if you'll remember such a small thing like that, how much more will the greater things that we really have desires that are important, you know. But anyway, it was just glorious to be able to see the earth from space. And I'm so excited to have seen that. And as we came back, we came back real fast. The, the continents rushed forward real fast. We came up to California and came up to the house. And, uh, you know, just to throw in one little thought, on the way by, I even thought about when we passed through the atmosphere, I thought about, boy, we passed through that barrier. I knew the barrier those astronauts talk about where you go through that penetrate and you have to hit it at just the perfect angle or they'll burn up. You know, you've always heard about that. Well, I knew when we passed through that barrier. And I thought to myself, man, he didn't have any trouble going through that. You know? <laughs> I mean, so you think the way you do now, you know, stupid, you know. I'm sure the Lord rolled his eyes on that one. You know, but. So just little thoughts to share with you that things you think about. I mean, your mind is still the same. You're still you, you know. And, uh, and so as we came back into, up to California, I saw my body lying on the floor. And at first, I, the Lord allowed me to feel that scripture, or that scripture, that scripture says, um, James 4.14, that life is but a vapor. Well, all of a sudden, I could see life as a, just a vapor. It was just, I actually saw a vapor go up, like above my house, a little vapor, like a tea kettle. And uh, I thought, wow, that's our life. Our hundred years or wherever we live here is that fast, it's gone. And it amazed me to see that. And I thought, wow, what we do... It, this little vapor counts for eternity. You see? And, and here we, we think that this is it. We think this is it. This life is it. And, you know, we, we want everything we want. This is so temporary. This is nothing compared to eternity. And what we do now counts for eternity. So that little, whatever the sacrifices you make now, it counts for eternity. And that's what it's all about. I mean, you know, to please the Lord. So anyway, it's hard to explain all that, but I mean, to see your life in just a puff of smoke go up and think, man, I've got to get out there and do what the Lord's called me to do. We don't have that much time. You know, it's time is short anyway, but this time is short compared to eternity. And so he allowed me to see that. And then we came up to my body and uh, I didn't want him to go. I just did not want Jesus to go. I was like, please don't go, you know. And, but I knew he was going to leave and then somehow I entered back through my mouth or nose I'm not sure which but I came back into my body I felt myself go back into my body and that's right when he left and that's when the terrors returned into my mind of hell all the memories of hell because you can't really live with the memories of hell uh, the terror part you can, the memory I have but the terror you cannot live and I knew instantly that my body was dying I knew I was going to die because the terror would kill my body I couldn't I couldn't live. And so I could feel my body dying. And I, I just was screaming. And I didn't know where I was. I didn't know what was going on at all. I didn't know if I was back. I didn't know anything. So my wife was praying, she said, for about 20 minutes. And then I started to realize, oh, I'm back. I'm not in hell. I'm back. I'm here. And I was so grateful to be back. But I was still in all this trauma. And I, I just said, pray the Lord takes that on my mind. I'm dying. My body's dying. So she prayed, and the Lord removed it. In a second, it left. And so the terror left, so my body could keep living. Uh, because like I said, it, you could not live with that kind of fear and terror. Uh, so God left the memory, graciously left the memory, but took away that fear. And then at that moment, I began to calm down. And, but it still took me about a year, a whole year, to settle down from this whole thing. Even with God removing that, it took about a year. Because, you know, it, I just felt frustrated because... You know, I know what the scripture says about hell. We believe in hell. But when you've been there and you come up to talk to somebody and they say, I don't believe in that Jesus stuff. I don't believe in the Bible. You just want to strangle them. You, you know? <laughs> you do. I mean, I, you want to slap them around and say, wake up. I mean, this, is your, this place is real. You're going to go there if you don't wake up. And so I was frustrated for a whole year. And Mary Kay Baxter told me that I would be. She said, you're going to be, have a frustrated until you settle down. You can't save everybody. You're going to, I wanted to witness everything that moved, you know. And, and that's just, you know, and that's a good thing, but yet you've got to, you know, temper that a little bit. So uh, a year later, you know, calm down. So, but during that year, we began speaking at different places and so forth. But, you know, the important thing is that all of us have been, been given something to do for the Lord. We all have an assignment. So God's called me to go and tell people because His desire is not for anybody to go to this place. Not one. There's not one person here who needs to go there. But it's your choice. 
And I just want to share with you a couple stories. We had so many uh, stories that, uh, experiences after this that verified my experience. So many. I just want to share two quick ones with you. And these are in the book. But uh, one, we went, we were asked to go to a church up in uh, Sacramento. And it was a Russian church. And I spoke there. And um, it was about 5,000 people there. And this is, I just started speaking, this huge crowd of people. Anyway, it, it had to be translated in Russian. Um, so at the end, uh, this old man shuffles up with a cane, and he came up to the front, and he waved, raised his cane, and he said to the people, this is the man I've been telling you about. Well, I didn't know what he was talking about, but he was an elder at the church, and, um, and everybody just went crazy and started clapping and screaming and everything. So afterwards, we said, what was that all about? And he, it, well, it turned out that he was in World War II. He was a German or a Russian Jew, and he was killed in Auschwitz. And I think it was Auschwitz, one of the camps. He was thrown into the ovens as a Jew, and he was, in, he was a, not a Christian. Uh, anyway, he went to hell. And somebody pulled him out and resuscitated him and brought him back, and so he wrote a book about his experience in hell. And he said, he prayed, Lord, have somebody someday come that will verify what I saw. Somebody, someday. So anyway, when he said, this is the man, that was in you know 1944, and here he is, you know, 60 years later. His prayer was answered. So that was really humbling for me to be an answer to this guy's prayer. I thought, wow, Lord, that's that's incredible. But but the important things are people that's gotten saved. We had one pastor that had sent a book to a lady, and he sent a DVD of me or a CD of me speaking at a church. And the lady didn't know what it was, so she started playing it. Her son walked through the room at the time, and he was in his 30s. He had just gotten out of prison. He'd been in prison for like 20 years. And he'd been on drugs, and and he would never listen to anything about the Bible. And he sat down and started listening to the CD. Well, at the end of the CD, she was amazed he was listening, but at the end of the CD, he fell on his knees, and he said, I've got to get saved. And he asked the Lord to be Lord of his life. It totally blew her away that her son finally, after all these 20 years, would get saved. But anyway, six hours later, he died in his sleep. And he was going to go to church the next morning. He was all excited and said, I'm going to testify that God saved me. I'm, I'm changing my life. I'm a Christian now. He was all excited. But the drugs killed his body. He was so far gone. But the mother was so thrilled that he got saved right before he died. You see? So that's what's, that's what's important, you know, that people get saved through all this. And, you know, you might be here tonight and you might be saying to yourself, you know, I'm a pretty good person. So I, I don't think I'm, I'm not going to go to that place. I'm pretty good. Well, you probably are pretty good compared to yourself. But you can't compare to yourself. You see, none of us can compare to ourselves. We have to compare to God. And His standard is a lot higher than ours. His standard is perfect. So He said in His Word, if you ever lie once, He said you'll have your part in the lake of fire. Revelation 21.8. If you ever commit fornication, if you have a thought towards Adultery or fornication. If you even think it, that's a sin. If you steal one thing, just one thing in your life, that you, makes you a thief and you can't go to heaven. So you see, we all are blown it. We all fall far short of God's uh, goodness and His standard. You know, it's like uh, if you compare, it's like a lady that saw the sheep on the hill and she said, you know, she looked at these white sheep and how pure and white they looked. And against the green hill. They looked so pure and white. And overnight she went to bed and it snowed. She got up and looked at the sheep the next morning and they were all dingy and dull compared to the white snow. So you see, if you compare yourself with God, you don't look so good. Matter of fact, he says your righteousness is as filthy rags to him. It says in Isaiah 64, 6. And um, it even goes on to say uh, in... Um, Oh, where is that scripture? It talks about in Job 15, 16. How much more abominable and filthy is man who drinks iniquity like water? So that's how we look to God, filthy. But you want to make sure, if you're here tonight, that your name is in the book of life. Because I want to give you three scriptures. This is the bad news, and I want to tell you the good news. But he said in Second Thessalonians 1, 9, Whoever does not obey the gospel shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. And John 3.36 says, uh, He that has the Son has everlasting life. But he that has not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And in Revelation 20.15 says, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That lake. 
are you sure tonight that your name is written in the book of life? Because this is something you've got to be absolutely certain about. Absolutely positive about. You don't even want to take one slight chance on it. Because you don't know how long you're going to live. You don't know you might not live till tomorrow. So you don't want to take a chance. If you don't know for sure, if there's anybody here tonight that does not know absolutely positively that their name is written in the book of life, I want you to to make a bold statement and just raise your hand and say, you know, I don't know. I don't know for sure. And I don't know if I've ever really repented of my sin because Jesus said that you have to repent. You know, if you don't repent, He said, you shall all likewise perish. And uh, so if you don't know if you've ever repented and asked Jesus to be Lord of your life, if you've never asked Him in your heart, I want you to do something and, and raise your hand and just say, I'm humble enough to admit I don't know. I can't say that I've ever done that. I've never really received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I've never really repented. And I don't know if my name's in the book of life. Would you raise your hand? Anybody here raise their hand and say that? Thank you for your honesty. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see those hands. Thank you. Praise you, Lord. You know, if, you just don't want to take a chance. Because I'm telling you, this place is real. Uh, you can think I'm crazy. But the scripture says it. And the place that you saw in the film, it's way worse than that. And it lasts for eternity. You know, and, and a lot of people, they'll check out if they're going to go to Europe for a trip. You'll check out the hotels. You'll do all the research. You know, to check out just for a vacation. You'll do all kinds of research. Well, you know, but hardly anybody checks out eternity. You know, and where, where you go forever. You, we need to know. So I really urge you tonight not to leave here unless you know absolutely for sure. And you can know for sure. You can raise your hand. You can come forward. We're going to pray for you in a little bit. But you can leave here with the assurance that you'll never have to go to this place and never fear any of it. Because there's no reason you have to fear it because you don't have to go there. But I want to make people aware of it so that you can see there is a real hell and, and you want to avoid it at all costs. You know, also, there's a lot of Christians, a lot of Christians that are living in a and really kind of a backslidden state. Many of us, you know, don't live the way we should live. And there's people that are saved, but they're, you know, they're living in some kind of sin. You know, and you can't be living in sin. You don't want to be living in a backslidden state where maybe you, uh, you know, you're living in a, a, you know, you're not married, and you're living with your girlfriend or your boyfriend, and you think that's okay, and you're getting away with it.
Yeah. 